In this video, we're going to be talking about the two parts of aerobic metabolism, so specifically the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. All right, so let's start with the, the Krebs cycle. Some other names for this would be the citric acid cycle in the trichoboxylic acid cycle, which this is often abbreviated TCA cycle. All of these, if you see them in textbooks or various sources online or other videos, they're all the same thing. They're all the Krebs cycle. All right, so the Krebs cycle is the starting point for the shared aerobic bioenergetic pathways, which is why we're starting with it in this video. In order for the Krebs cycle to work, we need to be fueling it with intermediaries, which are basically substances that it can use. All right, so there's various ways we can do this. Um, we can do it through lots of different other um, energy substrates. All right, so let's talk about each of those uh, right now. So glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose um, or carbohydrate, uh, contributes to the Krebs cycle. Um, uh, this is what I have up here sort of highlighted in this green text and these green boxes and arrows. Um, it contributes to it two pyruvate molecules per uh, glucose molecule that's been broken down. So basically that we're going to be sending a pyruvate molecule into here. It's going to be going through the process of pyruv pyruvate decarboxylation. In the process of doing that, we create an NADH molecule. We also produce a CO2. So this is the first time we're seeing CO2 being produced in bioenergetics um, outside of acid-base buffering that might happen in the blood. And we're also going to be producing an acetyl-CoA molecule, which is typically uh, talked about as the starting place for the Krebs cycle, even though in reality there really is no starting place for the Krebs cycle. But it is the starting place for how carbohydrates contribute to the Krebs cycle. All right, so this is how we get um, intermediaries out of glycolysis and out of carbohydrates. If we are looking at um, fat, all right, so beta oxidation is the process of breaking down fat. It contributes to the Krebs cycle also through creating acetyl-CoA. So beta oxidation creates acetyl-CoA that does go into the Krebs cycle again there. Protein can also contribute to the Krebs cycle. Um, the process of breaking down protein is called protein catabolism. Uh, remember that protein is minimally involved in bioenergetics. Our body tries to conserve protein. It does not want to use protein in order to make energy. We want to use protein in order to build structures, things like muscle and different organs and tissues like that. So we don't typically want to do this, but we can when we need to. When the energy of the body starts to get low, um, protein will contribute more than it does when energy is prevalent in the body, but it's still, even when it's being at, you know, at its highest, maybe 10% of total energy is going to come from protein. And so um, I, I didn't mark it in here. I, I did put a little note here about protein catabolism. Protein catabolism, depending on the amino acid being broken down and how it's being broken down, it can contribute to various different steps, including immediately uh, into the acetyl-CoA step, that the glycolysis and you know fat breakdown processes contributed to. So that was everything that gets put into the Krebs cycle. Let's talk about once the Krebs cycle is going, what's happening. So I think it's we first actually need to mention the fact that the Krebs cycle happens within the mitochondria. So all aerobic metabolism happens in the mitochondria. Um, so the Krebs cycle uh, requires oxygen to be present. Everything in the mitochondria, all the processes requires oxygen to be present, but the Krebs cycle itself does not use oxygen. When the oxygen is not present to keep the electron transport chain going, the Krebs cycle will back up and that causes it to eventually stop or slow down dramatically. All right, so the Krebs cycle though goes through all these steps in this circle, which is why it's called a cycle. The Krebs cycle is going, going to be producing three NADH molecules, one here, one here, and one here. Uh, through one one full cycle of the Krebs cycle. If you are going to be starting with glycolysis and contributing pyruvate, it has to be go through the pyruvate decarboxylation uh, process in order to become acetyl-CoA. You also produce another NADH molecule right here. So that adds to the three, so three plus one, giving you four um, NADH molecules per pyruvate molecule that goes into the Krebs cycle. We also produce one FADH2 molecule right here, and we also produce one GTP molecule, uh, which is kind of like ATP, um, but we don't use it so prevalently in the body. Um, it is actually immediately used in order to, it's, it's converted down to GDP, releasing an inorganic phosphate, and in the process we uh, 
we actually make an ATP from ADP. So from the Krebs cycle, we actually get one ATP molecule um, from this GTP molecule that was produced. And we also end up with two CO2 molecules being produced, one here and one here. Um, a third one, again, if you're using glycolysis through pyruvate and the pyru pyruvate decarboxylation, uh, ending with this CO2 right here. So that would give you three CO2s if you're starting from the glycolysis angle in, into the Krebs cycle here. So I've talked a lot about NAD and FADH2, but I haven't really mentioned what it is. So let's do that now. So these are um, these two are going to be electron and hydrogen carrying molecules. The NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, and when we make it into a high energy, we also add a, an extra hydrogen onto that. So that's when it, the NADH is a high energy version of that. And so, um, the reason why it's high energy is because it, it has uh, some electrons, actually has, so it has two electrons, and in the process it has a, a single hydrogen and it also releases a hydrogen ion um, into uh, the, the solution whenever we go from NAD to NADH. And so when we pump the NADH into the electron transport chain, which is where we're going soon with this video, um, we end up getting 2.5 ATP molecules per NADH molecule that is broken down. However, that is, that is not the only way we can use NADH. We can also use it anaerobically. So when we're using a lot of anaerobic metabolism and glycolysis is running faster than aerobic metabolism can keep up and we're making uh, lactates, the production of lactate from, from pyruvate actually requires an NADH molecule uh, in order to do that. So we break down one of the NADH molecules back into NAD in order to produce um, lactate from, from pyruvate. And so this is, it, a lot of people think of this as like a, a bad thing that we're making lactate, but actually lactate allows your glycolysis pathway to continue to function. Because if you just ended with pyruvate and we had a buildup of pyruvate because aerobic metabolism isn't keeping up with glycolysis, glycolysis would shut down, meaning we would have a decrease, a significant decrease in our ability to produce energy in order to keep fueling exercise. All right, so, and this was NADH. Let's talk about the FAD or the FADH2. FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. Um, in just like with NADH, um, FADH2 is the high energy version of FAD. When we take FAD, and we add to it a couple hydrogen ions and two electrons, and we turn it into FADH2, that's actually the high energy version of FAD. So um, this is the version that's going to be going into the electron transport chain in order to make ATP, and we get 1.5 ATP molecules out of every FADH2 molecule that is broken down in the electron transport chain. So now let's look at the electron transport chain. Another name for this is oxidative phosphorylation. They're the same thing. So again, if you see that in a textbook, other videos online or other classes, um, we're talking about the same thing. So this also occurs in the mitochondria and it is an oxidative uh, process. So it's aerobic. Remember all processes that happen in the mitochondria are aerobic processes. All right, so in this, we're going to be taking the NADHs and the FADH2 molecules that were produced in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle. And we're actually going to be stripping off their electrons and stripping off their hydrogen ions in order to um, make this process go. So when we break down the NADHs and FADH2s, uh, what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be pumping the hydrogen ions from this inside the matrix or from these various molecules into this space here. So we have the mitochondria that has two membranes in it. So we have the outer membrane, which is what we have right here. And then we have this inner squiggly looking membrane here, which is what this membrane is right here where all these complexes are embedded. All right, so these complexes again are going to be pumping the hydrogen ions into this intermembrane space, so the space between membranes. And by doing that, we are creating a gradient a proton and hydrogen gradients, the hydrogen being the proton, that will eventually be used in order to make ATP. So if you quickly kind of follow this process, we have an electron that comes off the NADH molecule, gets past the coenzyme Q, and passed eventually to this complex three. We also have an electron coming off the FADH2 molecules, going to coenzyme Q, again, eventually being passed to 
complex three. That electron then will go to cytochrome C that passes it to complex four. So a lot of different steps here, but all it is is handing off of the electron in, in the process, pumping hydrogen here, here, so here, here, and then also here into this intermembrane space. Then the electron eventually comes down here where it joins with oxygen and joins with um, some hydrogen ions and oxygen in order to produce water, so H2O. So the final electron acceptor here is going to be the oxygen. That's why I have this star here. It's a super important step. This is where oxygen finally becomes part of aerobic metabolism. So the oxygen becomes the final electron acceptor and the final hydrogen ion acceptor, creating water in the process. And what it did was created this large gradient here. So it's basically a battery within the mitochondria that can go through the ATP synthase complex. And uh, so the hydrogen goes through this, kind of going down, think of it like going th uh, water going through a dam. And in the process, it is able to use this gradient to make ADP back into ATP, making all the energy that comes from um, the electron transport chain. All right, so from one glucose molecule, we end up with 28 ATP molecules from all this process here. We also end up with 12 water molecules. Hopefully before you watch this video, watch the, the glycolysis video where we talk about breaking down glucose, producing all these NADHs and FADH2s. Uh, but if you haven't, go back and watch that. I'll put a link in the description below for that. I'll also put a link in the description below to the video on how we use uh, fat metabolism and break down fat in order to also get NADHs and FADH2s. And I'll also put a link in the description below to a video going over some of the various ways that the bioenergetic, bioenergetic pathways are modulated to sort of speed up or slow down those pathways.